Thank you for joining us today for the Distinguished Faculty Lecture, Climate Change Solutions, Finding Common Ground When Experts and Models Disagree, presented by Aaron Baker, Distinguished Professor in the Department of Mechanical and Industrial Engineering and Faculty Director of the Energy Transition Institute. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to explain how this event will proceed today. After Professor Baker's presentation, there will be an opportunity for questions. Then at the conclusion of the program, I will present Professor Baker with the Chancellor's Medal, the campus's highest recognition. At the conclusion of today's event, we'll have a reception with a low carbon footprint menu prepared by UMass Dining, appropriately. Um, and a recording of this lecture will be posted on the Distinguished Faculty Lecture website in the coming days. So we'll start off today um, by uh, introducing Dean Sanjay Raman, uh, who's the Dean of the College of Engineering. Dean Raman, will you please introduce our speaker? Thank you, Provost Sirio. It is my great pleasure to introduce my colleague, Dr. Aaron Baker, Distinguished Professor of Mechanical Industrial Engineering for this fall's fall of 2022 Distinguished Faculty Lecture. Since joining the U University of Massachusetts in 2002, Aaron has established herself as a leading energy environment researcher with a particular focus on applying modeling techniques to address questions of energy planning in the face of climate change. And she is a true champion for diversity, equity, inclusion, and social justice across campus and across our community. Her research is wide ranging. It includes inclusive, I'm sorry, incisive assessment of sustainable energy technologies, novel methodologies for electricity planning in developing countries, and investment approaches for publicly funded energy technology, research and development portfolios. This wide-ranging research is unified not only by its consistent excellence and originality, but also by its consistent focus on energy justice. Erin earned her BA in Applied Mathematics from the University of California, Berkeley, and her MS and PhD in Engineering Economic Systems and Operations Research from Stanford University. She is an associate editor for the IISE Transactions, the flagship journal for the Institute of Industrial and Systems Engineering. She is a member of the Macro Energy Systems Steering Committee, the Institute for Operations Research and Management Sciences, the Association for Environmental and Resource Economics, and the International Association for Energy Economics, and the Decision <laughs> Analysis Society. During her time at UMass, Erin has received numerous recognitions for her research, including a Best Publication Award from Energy, Natural Resources, and the Environment, a Campbell Watkins Energy Journal Best Paper Award, and a National Science Foundation Career Award. She has also received a number of recognitions for her teaching and mentorship, including the College of Engineering Outstanding Senior Faculty Award, the Distinguished Graduate Mentor Award, and the Industrial Engineering and Operations Research Professor of the Year Award. She was appointed as the Armstrong Professor, Professional Development Professor from 2017 to 2020. Erin has supervised over a dozen doctoral students, several of whom now hold prominent positions in academia and industry and she teaches an array of popular courses at both the graduate and undergraduate level in sustainable, sustainability, economic decision making, and the engineering economy. She has served as the College of Engineering Director of Faculty Diversity and the Dean for, uh, Associate Dean for Gra Research and Graduate Affairs, and since 2020, the Faculty Director for the Energy Transition Institute, which focuses on facilitating an equitable and effective transition away from fossil fuels and to a decarbonized energy system in the United States. Aaron, congratulations on this thoroughly well-deserved honor, and we are looking forward to your time. All right, well, thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction, for being invited to give this lecture, and thank you for everyone for showing up for this lecture. All right, so I think I will use. So for all of us, that live in Amherst, we see these kind of behemoths coming to floating over our campus. Hey, these are some of the largest airplanes in the world. And I always feel a little bit like I'm living in a sci-fi or steampunk world when I see them go by. 
These planes are the result of innovation. Okay? Invention happened at Kitty Hawk when they got that first plane off the ground. Between that and the 60 or 70 years until the galaxy took off, it was innovation. There were improvements by scientists and engineers, by pilots and mechanics, by accountants. Right? Lots of people had ideas and made improvements and ended up with this kind of technological wonder. Okay. A great and classic example of the power of innovation is the fact that that entire first flight at Kitty Hawk, right, the height and the distance of that flight, could take place inside the super galaxy. <laughs> so what does this have to do with climate change? For me, it really gives me hope. Right? It's a sign of human innovation and ingenuity, right? that we can take this and apply it to climate change. So when I started working on climate change in the 90s, we were concerned about it, but honestly, it was something a little bit abstract and off in the future. Sadly, the future seems to be now. Right? We're faced with these wildfires in my home state of California and across the West. We have um, this to work. floods in New Jersey and um, Tennessee, as, around, as well as around the world, and these crazy heat domes we're having in Portland, Oregon. So the IPCC, which is actually meeting right now, but they recently called climate change a code red for humanity. The idea is we need to reduce carbon and other greenhouse gas emissions. We need to do it decisively and quickly. But there are questions. Okay? People are really, really worried about the cost of addressing climate change. We saw it locally, the town of Hadley, the next town over, they just refused to pass a climate bylaw because they were worried about the cost. Okay? We see up here, that's a Republican senator. He's worried it's going to hurt American families. Even Greta Thunberg, right, who we know is well aware of the need to fight climate change, but you can see from her quote here, she's worried that it requires inevitable sacrifice. Is this a good reason, an important reason, to slow down our you know, addressing this existential threat? Okay, so I argue no, because people are ingenuitive and innovative. And more than that, we don't realize how ingenuitive and innovative we are. We're often surprised by innovation. And so this means that we really can move forward being a little bit more confident about our ability to fight climate change. So I work on climate solutions, right? I look at, at technological change and improvements in climate solutions. Some of them are getting established, some are emerging, and some are still a little bit futuristic. For the last 15 to 17 years, I have collected and analyzed expert opinions and database forecasts on technological change to understand where technologies will go. What I have found, especially in the last few years, is that when it comes to technological change, there's a real tendency to underpromise and overperform. Right? We do better than we think that we will. We can look at examples in the last 10 years. So offshore wind energy, giant wind turbines that we go put in the ocean. Until 2014, they were actually increasing in cost. Right? We were learning more about them, and we found out, oops, we have to do this, we have to do that. They became more expensive. But in 2014, they took a huge downturn and reduced in cost by 50% over six years. Okay? That surprised the experts. We did a very large scale study with like hundreds of experts, and more than 85% of them were surprised by this, were very surprised, right? They thought there was no, like, not even a 1% chance of this happening, and yet it happened. Okay, if we look at solar, solar between 2010 and 2020 reduced cost by 70%. Again, this surprised the experts. Almost all, actually not almost all, even the most optimistic experts didn't predict the cost would come down this much even by 2030. And yet by 2020, we had already gotten there. 
Okay, we can look at batteries for electric vehicles. They reduced in cost by 85% over 10 years. Okay, this was lower than 37 separate studies put the cost at 2030, even sometimes 2050. Okay, so we've done really, really well in the last few years, and it surprised everybody. Okay, and again, back to the Wright brothers, my favorite example of surprising technological change. So Wilbur Wright said to his brother in 1901, man will not fly for 50 years. Okay, two years later, he was aloft in the plane that he and his brother had invented. So this, this being surprised about how much we can do, it really turns out to be the norm. Okay? It's very difficult, or, or, sorry, put it the other way around, it's easy to think of all the ways that something might go wrong. Okay? You, you look at that crazy plane there, right? Really easy to see how that maybe not, wouldn't have gone anywhere. But it's really hard to think of the actually the infinite number of ways that things can go right. Right? That's actually unconstrained. Things can go right in a lot of different ways, and it's really hard to think about it. So we tend to underestimate our ability to innovate. Okay? Adding a little bit of complexity, humans are actually really bad at reasoning about cumulative change. So anytime change builds on top of other change, we don't do a very good job at that. That means that we tend to underestimate the growth of new technologies, and therefore, again, underestimate how much their costs are going to come down. Okay, so this, again, this is good news for, um, for climate change. I'm trying to remember what I wanted to make this point here. Okay, yeah, so this is good news and it has policy implications. Okay, we can think of an example of a similar thing to climate change is the Clean Air Act. Hey, that came in about 50 years ago, and it's radically reduced air pollution in those 50 years. When they were arguing about the Clean Air Act, people were really worried about the cost. They had all kinds of estimates, and it turns out that all those estimates were too high. The Clean Air Act didn't cost us anything close to what we expected it would cost us. And this is because of innovation and ingenuity. Hey, firms are very creative when they're faced with a challenge. They figure out all kinds of ways to make a profit in a new landscape. Hey, people invent new technologies and they innovate and improve the old ones. And while they're doing that, it didn't just clean the air, but opens new opportunities altogether, whole new markets that people didn't even think about. Okay? And so we can innovate, we can solve problems and do it relatively easily, but it doesn't happen just like magic, right? The air wouldn't have gotten clean if we didn't have the Clean Air Act. So we need to set goals and we need to have regulations and policies and leadership to help this happen. Okay, so let's look again at wind energy and especially offshore wind energy. So if you look at that first picture on the left, that's from the early 1970s. That's from Bill Hieronymus who was at the UMass Wind Energy Center. So in the 1970s, he kind of did the very earliest, even before invention, right? He imagined floating offshore wind. Offshore wind was, didn't even happen, and he imagined floating offshore wind. Okay, this was 40 years before the first turbine was actually kind of anchored into the ground. Right? Meanwhile, we had innovation going from Dutch windmills to wind turbines. So the one on the right, if you see that wind turbine there, that's also at UMass. That was in the mid-70s. That was the largest operating wind turbine in the United States at the time, and it now sits in the Smithsonian. So we innovated to there, and then we get to near where we are now, okay? These massive, massive offshore wind turbines. So the picture they're showing, nearly as tall as the Eiffel Tower. Okay, so we have innovated a lot. These are the largest rotating machines on Earth. I always love that statement there. So we have innovated a lot technologically, and so that's really great. But technological innovation alone actually isn't quite enough. There are other aspects that we need. To get these things in the water and get running, we need innovation along the entire supply chain. So there's things like installation, 
There's ships that need to be designed and built. There's uh, transmission. There is, uh, you know, management. There's finance. There's like a lot of things that need to get done to really get these in the water. Um, and we can see the importance of this and of leadership by looking at the U.S. until recently. The U.S. had very little leadership around offshore wind until very, very recently, and we fell far behind. Hey, we have five small turbines off the coast of Rhode Island. That's all we have. Um, but uh, Biden has now set a goal, so that's exciting. He set a goal for this, uh, what is it, 30 gigawatts by 2030. This is a very ambitious goal. Hey, when he set this goal, there were only 30 gigawatts of offshore wind in the entire world. So we were going to match the entire world by 2030. I think it's a very doable goal, though, because it's growing in leaps and bounds. Actually, I can't even keep track of, of how many there are now. It's growing so fast. So we, we can do this. We have this goal, and we can do it. The goal itself, though, is crucial, because in order to get all these industries, the installers and the you know, maintenance people and all these people, to get them investing and growing and being ready, they need to know there's going to be an offshore wind industry. And so this goal and the regulations that support it are really, really important, right? This is what's going to cause the innovation to happen. Okay, so the takeaway of this first part of my talk is that we do need to be brave. We need to set very ambitious goals, right? It's really important for us to do that. Now, again, I don't want to give the impression that this will in any way be easy. It is not going to be easy to solve climate change, right? But it wasn't easy to put a man on the moon. It um, wasn't easy to come up with a COVID vaccine. So it's not really about easy, but it's about making our world a much better place. Sure, come on in. <laughs> you can sit up here. All right, so now I'm going to dig in a little bit to um, a specific kind of regulation policy goal that the government can do. And that's government-funded clean energy R&D, research and development. So some of the technological change that I showed you before, solar for sure, and some of those other ones, part of that was a result of government-funded R&D. Okay? And to the degree that our goals are not ambitious enough, which I think they are not ambitious enough right now at all, Having R&D kind of keeps us moving in the right direction. So we want to think about R&D. At the same time, the government has a lot of different things to spend money on, right? There's a lot of important things. There's a lot of health issues. There's many, many things. So our resources are limited. So we need to think about how to allocate our resources to these R&D programs. And so that's what I've spent a lot of my career working on. Hey, it's a hard problem for a number of reasons. But one of the things that makes it especially hard is what I call, or what some people call, deep uncertainty. So there's a lot of uncertainty around these R&D programs. We're uncertain about how the technologies might evolve if we invest in them, and we're uncertain about climate change. So we have uncertainty. But it goes even beyond plain old uncertainty, right? That's where, okay, I don't know what the cost of solar will be in 2050, so you can have a probability distribution over that. That's uncertainty. But we have deep uncertainty, meaning we have conflicting sources of information. So we don't just have one probability distribution, but we have all those colored distributions back there. We have a whole bunch of different experts giving us different distributions. And those are just experts. We also have a whole bunch of different methods. You put those methods together, they all are giving you different forecasts. And so you, a decision maker is left with a really hard problem, right? They have this conflicting information. And so this is what we want to try to address. And then it becomes even more difficult. Okay? So you have uncertainty over something like the cost of solar in 2050. But beyond that, we actually have different models. And we don't know which models are, are right or correct. Okay? So models go beyond just parameters to kind of different shapes, like you see those different shapes there. And really, they go even more. They have different worldviews, different processes. So we have these different models, and they're very difficult because you really, you can't just like average models together. And so it's a really hard problem. What do you do when you have this deep uncertainty? 
Okay, and so, again, before talking about decision-making under deep uncertainty, we have to think of decision-making under uncertainty. This is from a paper that some colleagues and I published in Nature Energy a few years ago. I'm gonna focus on just the jump to the most complicated part of decision-making, and that's called dynamic decision-making under uncertainty with learning. So this is like what we have with climate change, okay? We have, we face decisions right now, maybe how much to invest in solar energy. We have a lot of uncertainties about how the technology is going to evolve, about how climate's going to evolve. But after, say, five years, we can kind of look around and see what's happened so far. And then, based on what's happened, we can make new decisions. We can invest more in this technology or we can throw it in the garbage can, right? We can make a new decision. So what I want to do as an analyst is think about that complicated problem, roll it all back, and say, what does that mean for what we do today? So that's a really complicated problem. There's like entire journals based on trying to solve these kind of problems. And it's complicated even if we only have one set of probability distributions over our parameters and one model. Okay? But the problem I want to solve now is even more difficult. We have this really complicated problem, and we have a whole bunch of probability distributions that disagree, and we have a whole bunch of models that disagree. So that's what I want to do. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how, what people have done with this so far. Um, and so this is really focused mostly on this parameter uncertainty. There's been very, very little thought about what to even do with multiple models. But the traditional method is that you have these different probability distributions, the colorful ones in the back. You can actually just average those together, and you get that flat one in the front. So we average them. That gives us a new probability distribution, and that's portable. We can plug it into different problems. So I can plug that into a dynamic decision-making problem under uncertainty and roll it back and come up with an answer. Okay, this is a very, very nice method, a very beautiful method, and it's, very, it's internally consistent. It's quite lovely method. But with the rise in climate change, there have been criticisms, and people have been saying it lacks external consistency. Okay, so I put that in quotes because I don't know exactly what they mean. But what I, what I take it to mean is, is if you look up at the top, and you can see kind of the, I don't know what the color is, the, the light-colored one on the left and the gray-colored one on the right, right, these different distributions, these are different experts. They're giving us predictions. They're not overlapping at all, yet we're just kind of averaging everything together, plugging it in, and giving the decision maker an answer. And so this is the way that I describe it. The problem is we're mathematically resolving disagreement and giving the decision makers a single answer. Then there's some approaches um, in economics. They're often called ambiguity aversion approaches, and in operations research, they're called robust optimization. So the poster child for these would be a min-max, if you're at all familiar with a min-max. The general idea is that you don't synthesize these in a portable manner, but you synthesize all these probability distributions in the context of a specific problem. Um, and so sometimes you, like the min-max, what it does is it picks the probability distribution that gives you the worst outcome, and then you optimize over that. That's just one example. So, these methods, I have to tell you, I'm not a big fan of these methods. They're lacking internal consistency, so they're not dynamically consistent, and they require a very crisp distinction between objective and subjective probabilities, and that doesn't actually exist. Um, so they're not great, but even worse, they still mathematically resolve the disagreement and re result in a single best answer. So these aren't really very satisfying. Now, there's another category of approaches which I do like and which are very complementary to what I'm going to show. So the poster child of these is called robust decision making, but there's a bunch of them. Um, so they're bottom-up exploratory methods. And in fact, um, Casey Brown in civil engineering here is, has one of these methods that he uses. So these methods, they, what they do is they start with a small number of alternatives and they evaluate them across the universe of possible beliefs, and then they iterate with the decision makers to think through, are there better alternatives out there, and, and what do we want to do? So in this case, they actually synthesize that uncertainty with a decision maker. Okay, so this, I think, is interesting and promising, and what I'm going to show you works well with this because we actually come up with a 
interesting small number of alternatives that you can kind of start this process on. All right, so I'm going to introduce our method, which is um, robust portfolio decision analysis. So this method has three key things that distinguish it. The first one is a portfolio decision analysis. So we argue that in a wicked problem like climate change, that you shouldn't just think of one thing at a time, but you really need to put multiple decisions together and see how they interact. Hey, this is most obvious for technology R&D problems. Hey, you don't want to decide what to invest in solar over here and then separately decide what to invest in nuclear over here because the outcomes of nuclear and solar have a lot of interactions with each other, so you want to think of them together. Hey, and we can make this even larger. We can think of you know, what our climate policy should be, what our R&D policy should be, what our technology should be. So we look at entire portfolios. All right, the second part is instead of rolling things back and having a single best decision, we come up with a, a, you know, set, of what I have, a set of good alternatives. I put that good in quotes. Um, these actually are a set of alternatives that are not bad. So we eliminate the bad ones, we're left with a set that are not bad and that are interesting to think about. Then we have one more step, which is we now go back to the individual alternatives inside and we identify ones that are robust throughout this set. And it's that piece there that's really finding the common ground. Right? We find some common ground and there's some evidence that that helps people move forward and opens up dialogue. Okay, so there's a couple of analytical pieces. I'm getting more and more into the kind of math part now. Um, so one piece is what we call belief dominance. So I'm using this word belief in a Bayesian sense. And so a belief is a probability distribution. Okay, that's how, how Bayes uses uh, the word belief, and I'm gonna use that. I broaden it out a little bit to include models. Okay, I argue that models are beliefs, right? It's the way that all these things go together. That's a form of belief. So belief dominance is a concept that's actually been around for a very long time. Our contribution is we really operationalized it so it can be used in decision making. It's been used in very theoretical ways before. So I'm illustrating it here. The idea is each of these red shapes is a probability distribution, right? That's what they're supposed to be, probability distributions. And we have a couple of alternatives, A and B. Okay, we evaluate A under this first probability distribution. So we, evaluate, you know, we take the expected objective of this alternative A, and we evaluate B, and we find that A is better than B if you have the first belief. And then we find that A and B are the same if you have the second belief. And then A is better than B under the third belief. So it doesn't matter what you believe, A is always better than B. So A dominates B, and we can throw B away. Okay? But this is what you don't, you don't get a fully ordered set because you can have other alternatives like C and D where neither one dominates the other. C is better than D sometimes, D is better than C sometimes, and so we leave them both in our set and consider these problems, right? They're not dominated. So it's not perfectly ordered, which is good and bad. Some people get frustrated because they're like, what's the best solution? So we actually don't give you the best solution, we give you a set. But many, especially policymakers, they kind of like that flexibility to look around and see what else is going on. And so that's one of the benefits of this. Um, and so this gives another illustration of how this works. All right, so if you look here, if you look at the dots, like those blue dots, each dot represents, here we're calling it a strategy, but it's a portfolio of alternatives, okay? So each dot represents a strategy. And if we look at like this strategy here, we evaluate it under this probability distribution and you know, the expected value or the expected objective is about 0.3. And we evaluate it under this probability distribution, we get about a 0.5 and so that's where we are. Now, the blue dots are all dominated. For every blue dot, there's another dot on here that's better for both probability distributions. Okay? And that's, that's true for all the blue dots. And the yellow dots on the outside, those are the ones that are non-dominated. There's no single um, other alternative that's better under both distributions. 
So the blue set is dominated. We throw those away and we keep the yellow set. That's our set of alternatives that are not bad. They're non-dominated. Now it looks like I've gone to the next slide. The nice thing about this um, method is we can apply it to models as well as to probability distributions. So you can take alternatives and you can evaluate them using the first model and using the second model, find our non-dominated set. And so this is a nice way to somehow synthesize these different conflicting models. Okay, and then the second part is this finding common ground. For this one, if you just look at the table over on the right, um, so here we have alternatives. So A is an alternative. I can invest in it or not. B is an alternative and so on. Each row is a portfolio. So in that first portfolio, we're investing in A, D, and E, not in B, C, and F. And what I'm showing here are six non, the six non-dominated portfolios. So we look at these six portfolios and we see, aha, there's you know, common ground. You never invest in B. It doesn't matter what your beliefs are, you're never gonna invest in B. It's a bad alternative. Let's just throw that alternative out and stop arguing about it. Okay? Similarly, we always invest in D. This is good, we should, we should just invest in it. We can agree that we're gonna invest in D. So now we have, you know, we have things to talk about, but we have less. We found some common ground. Now we have this A, C, E, and F. Maybe we gather more information about these. Maybe we negotiate. Maybe we start thinking a little bit harder about some of the more qualitative aspects that are a little bit harder to get into um, models and that kind of thing. OK, so now let me show you how we apply this to um, climate R&D technology. All right, let me see if I can get my little. There we go, OK. So, what I have on the top, this flowcharty thing, is actually what's called an influence diagram. It's a way to represent decisions. And the uh, square represents the alternatives. And here, our question is, how much should we invest in which technologies? So here, our alternatives that we looked at were five different technologies. We look at solar PV, nuclear, carbon capture, uh, liquid biofuels, and electricity from biomass. So we have five technologies. For each of these technologies, we considered either a low, medium, or high investment. And so that gives us all together 243 portfolios. So our alternatives are 243 portfolios. The oval represents uncertainties. We don't know how the technologies are gonna turn out after we invest in them. We use eight parameters to measure this. We have a cost for each of the five technologies, and we have an efficiency for three of the technologies. So we had eight uncertain parameters. We're uncertain about them. This arrow means that we believe that the probability distribution over the parameters depends on how much we invest in which technology. Okay, and so what we have here are conditional probability distributions over the costs and efficiencies of these technologies. Now, to make it even more complicated, we have three large-scale expert elicitation studies. So three different studies were done independently, working with experts, getting their opinions on the conditional probability over where these technologies will go. Okay, one of the studies was done by me out of UMass, one is out of Harvard, and one is out of a group called Theme. So we're, gonna, we're not going to average those, we're going to use those for this belief dominance. Okay, then, we're looking at policies. I'm going to focus on this $125 a ton of carbon tax. Okay, that's one possible policy. Um, we use a model to tell us how, what that policy is going to do in the economy. Okay, so this model is called GCAM. It's an integrated assessment model. It integrates a model of the economy, a model of the climate, and technological detail and you can give it a carbon tax, and then we can give it various values for the costs and efficiencies of these technologies, and it will roll things forward, and it will tell us what's the cost of that tax, what's the emissions path, and what is the temperature path that you're gonna end up with. Okay, so we get that out of the model. Then we have uncertainty about the damages from climate change. And to get this, we go to three different um, other integrated assessment models. These are cost-benefit models. These three models are used actually to set um, you, some US policy 
uh, in the US, so what's called the social cost of carbon. We use their damage models to figure out what the damages from climate change are. Then, our objective, all right, what we're trying to do is minimize the cost of investment, the cost of the policy, and the damages from climate change. We want to minimize all those things together by choosing a, an R&D portfolio. Okay, so this is, this is what we did. Just thought I'd point out, so there's, there's a lot of work on this slide, right? These things on the bottom are all huge projects that involve uh, sometimes, you know, five, sometimes 35 people, and some of them have been going for like 15 or 20 years. So there's a lot of work. I didn't do all this work myself, but a lot of work went into this. And then um, this is what me and my colleagues, we put all these things together, and that was probably, you know, a couple years worth of work, but I'm going to jump straight to the results. Okay, so what do we have here? These, oops, ah, these are um, the non-dominated portfolios. Okay, so the first, the portfolio in the first row, high investment in solar, a low investment in nuclear, low in biofuels, high in electricity from biomass, and low in carbon capture. And this is showing the cost um, of R&D per year. So we ended up with 16 non-dominated portfolios. This was a proof of concept, and we were actually very happy with that. Because the one thing about this dominance is that it's not clear, right? We could have ended up with 217 non-dominated portfolios, and that would not have been very interesting. So we were pretty happy that with three elicitation studies and three models, which actually give us nine different beliefs, right? Because each combination is a belief, that we actually narrowed it down quite a bit. So that was the first thing we were happy about. The second is that we saw, and again, we weren't sure if this would happen, but we did find some common ground. We found that it didn't matter what your beliefs were, what your models are, you always have a high investment in solar, and you always have a high investment in electricity from biomass. So we can kind of stop arguing about those. We can focus on these other technologies, nuclear, biofuels, and carbon capture. Okay, so let me see if I can explain this complicated one. So, each row here, we're looking at a particular technology. So we're here, we're looking at nuclear, and what's the R&D investment in nuclear? The columns are for these different damage models, and so this is the column related to the DICE damage model. The triangle is a ternary diagram. Now, you can't see it, it's too small, but on the corner of each, or on each corner is one of these expert elicitation studies, and so UMass is down here, Theme, and Harvard. Every point on this um, triangle puts a weighting on these three uh, elicitation studies. So down here, you're putting all your weight on UMass, right smack in the middle, you're doing one third, one third, one third. Okay, for each of those weightings then, we say what's the optimal portfolio and what's the investment in nuclear in that portfolio? And what we saw is if you use DICE, it didn't matter too much which study you use, you almost always end up with a high investment in nuclear. So what was interesting to us was this, this kind of stark difference here, though. When you use these other two models, you end up almost always with a mid-investment in nuclear. So what this told us is that it's really important to think about the structure of damages, climate damages, in order to think about how much we should be investing in nuclear R&D. So this is a place where there's kind of a fundamental, you know, we really need to think this through. For the other two technologies, you know, it, it was not as stark, right? We see here a little bit of disagreement between the different um, studies, right? If you, if you don't trust my study at all, then you would end up with a low investment. And if you put a little bit more weight on the UMass study, you'd end up with a higher investment. But these ones here have a somewhat robust solution. So it, it highlighted where the kind of key disagreement and the key challenge is and where it's not. Um, here, I'm just going to show, so we picked a policy, $125 a ton carbon tax. We do not have that policy going right now in the United States, right? Um, we're not really sure where exactly, we're, we're moving in the direction of climate policy. Okay? We're not quite as radical as we like. So we looked at different policies, a $50 a ton tax and a no policy. So one thing that was kind of interesting is that as the tax got higher, we had a smaller, robust set. We ended up with 37 in our, in our set here and 56 under the business as usual. Um, so, you know, I don't know quite what that means, but if we do move towards more ambitious goals, which I think we should do, it means we'll have a little bit less disagreement over the optimal portfolios. But what we did notice 
is that when we looked at the three different policy, it turned out there were four portfolios that were in each of the non-dominated groups. And so we would argue that these seem like a really good place to start your conversation. So now you can start doing kind of robust decision making, thinking about what these portfolios are telling us, and then make a decision on what to do. Okay, so again, I don't leave you with a single best answer, but we have a pretty good set of, of uh, alternatives to think about. Okay, so for this part of the talk, I do have one more part. But for this part, I just want to emphasize that deep uncertainty is, is a real thing, and it's very difficult. And there is sometimes a tendency for people to say, all these experts are disagreeing, they're telling me different things, I'm just going to go with my gut feeling. Right? And I mean, that comes up a lot. And my argument is that there is some real value we can get out of this analysis. We can avoid mistakes, and we can highlight where the actual disagreement is. And so it's kind of an argument for trying to use analysis, but using it in such a way that we leave flexibility for the decision makers, for the policy makers, because there's, you, can't, you, you can't represent everything in a model and in your analysis. OK, and the one more thing that I want to talk about is what I've been working on more recently. And this is on energy equity, right? Social justice and social equity in the energy system. And so the Energy Transition Institute is a new institute at UMass all across campus, and it's focused on this topic. And so if you're interested in energy equity, you should look us up. And then this Elevate program is in particular a graduate uh, research and training program on this topic. So first, we have to recognize the inequities in our current energy system. Um, so one is around pollution, pollution from fossil fuel plants, actually from biomass plants as well. It turns out that polluting power plants are way disproportionately in low-income areas. And not only that, but they're disproportionately in communities of color. Okay, so one example is one of the most polluting coal power plants in the country was in New Jersey. If you looked at the area right around it, that area, the people who lived there were 75% people of color. Whereas once you spread out to the whole state, it was only 32% people of color. Okay, and that happens over and over. And so we see that the location of these polluting plants is racist. Um, Power outages are also racist, or at least they were that, that one in 2010 in Texas, the one during winter that killed about 200 people. Jay Tanasia in electrical engineering did a study on that. They found that the long outages were four times more likely in communities of color than in predominantly white communities. Okay? And they found actually no relationship to income. There was just something purely racist going on. It's also, the energy system is regressive. Low-income people pay huge amounts of their income on energy bills. And it's not just that they have a lower income, and we all spend a somewhat similar amount for energy, but so many low-income people live in housing that's also low quality and inefficient. So mobile homes being one of the most extreme cases, people pay twice as much per square meter or square foot for their energy. So they're low income, they're trying to stay warm or stay cool, and they're, they're paying twice as much as wealthier people are. So we're transitioning, our energy system is changing, it needs to change, and that's good, and that gives us an opportunity to build a more equitable and just system, but it's not automatic. I find a lot of people are like, oh, solar is so nice. You know, they just assume somehow solar is going to be more equitable than other technologies. But unfortunately, it's not. So in Massachusetts, we, um, everyone, every rate payer, rich and poor, pays money into a fund, which then subsidizes rooftop solar. Okay, so everybody pays this money, but that money doesn't go to everybody equally. Right? Rooftop solar is generally in you know, white, upper middle class, suburbs, people who own houses, right? so you own your roof and you, have, you don't have sh buildings or anything shading your roof. So these subsidies are really taking money from the poor and giving it to the rich. So we need to be thinking very carefully about our policies. And then biomass, I mentioned biomass plants. While there's some promise for climate change, they're, they're pretty polluting. Right? If you think of like burning wood, right? when you burn wood, it's kind of dirty. 
It's almost as dirty as coal. It's pretty polluting. There was a biomass plant planned to be in Springfield, right down the, down the road from us. Springfield, Massachusetts is pretty low income, has very many people below the poverty line, has a large community of color. And worse, they actually have been called the asthma capital of the US. They have so much asthma. And yet we were putting a biomass plant there. You know, we really have to ask, like, does that really make sense? Is that equitable? Is this the way that we want to do things? Okay, and so what I'm just going to give today is one example of some uh, research we're doing right now to think about how energy and energy technology and social equity go together. And so we're looking at carbon capture, one of the other technologies I mentioned earlier. This is where you have a coal plant, you burn your coal, but instead of releasing the CO2 into the atmosphere, you can capture it and then bury it in a, a hole in the ground. Okay, so they're controversial for a number of reasons, but this is very controversial among um, environmental justice communities. So these are the people, low income and people of color, who live near polluting coal plants. And they're like, you have got to be kidding me, right? You're going to solve climate change, but you're going to keep running this polluting power plant down the street from me? They, they're just a little bit enraged that we would even think about doing that, right? So we wanted to dig into it a little bit and see what the impacts of carbon capture are. And we wanted to look at it in an electricity system, right, with transmission and different, you know, different demands. Because it turns out um, electricity systems, transmission systems are very, very complicated and things don't always work out the way that you would predict that they would. So this project is a collaboration with, yeah, with Michael Ash from Economics and Bridget Diana with Goban Zakari from Industrial Engineering and mostly the work of Paula Ferlinetta, uh, a PhD student in Industrial Engineering. So we looked at a very simple model. We have a coal plant, a natural gas plant, and some wind energy, and we have the possibility of carbon capture. And so if you look at, yeah, this chart here, what we're showing is along here is different amounts of wind energy, and we're showing the global emissions, the CO2, the greenhouse gas emissions. And these three bars are for three different climate policies. The tall bar is if there's no restriction. The middle bar is a medium restriction that has to be below this blue line, and the third bar has to be below the red line. And we see here what we would predict. As you have more stringent climate policy, you get fewer CO2 emissions. As you have more wind, you get fewer CO2 emissions. So that, that goes the way we would expect it to go. But when we started looking at local emissions, so these are what are called NOx and SOx and particulate matter, we didn't find such a nice pattern. So here, when there's no wind, we find that actually the most stringent climate policy has the most local pollution. Now that turns out to be largely because carbon capture requires a lot of energy. And so you actually have to run these plants more. And so you end up with more pollution than you had when you started. And then we found even when we added wind, we actually got even more pollution. And this had to do with the fact is then CCS wasn't useful on the gas plant, so therefore you ran your coal plant twice as much as you ran it before and you end up with even more pollution. Okay, so this is just kind of an illustration of some of the problems that can come up. What we're going to do is look at an actual case study in Mobile, Alabama. There's a coal plant, there's natural gas, we're probably going to look at solar there. Try to understand how carbon policy will affect local pollution, and then how we can add environmental policy or potentially new technologies to see if we can make this better. Okay, so this is just emerging work, mostly presenting it just to get people thinking and inspired as to, you know, are you interested? Would you like to participate in research that brings together technological innovation and equity? And so if so, please look into the Energy Transition Institute. All right, so in summary, um, humans are ingenuitive but we have a tendency to underestimate how ingenuitive we are. We really need to set goals to head us in the right direction. The more ambitious those goals are, the more innovation we'll see. We've got to keep equity in mind when we're setting these goals. And research and development can be a good avenue. We want to invest in promising technologies. 
we want to keep, again, keep an eye on equity, and we want to think about harm reduction very early on. All right, and so finally, I want to leave you with the idea that we should act boldly. Okay? We could fiddle around with incremental changes while our world is burning. Or we can trust in human ingenuity and set ambitious goals and take flight into a world that's cleaner, cooler, and more just. Thank you. Thanks, Professor Baker, for a wonderful uh, presentation. I think you know, the idea that you can use analytical methods to access complexity that is beyond the limit of our own intuition really gives me a lot of hope, especially in this space. So I thank you for sharing those insights with us. Um, I now would like to invite uh, questions from the audience. If I could ask you to please uh, step up to the microphone uh, to ask your questions to Professor Baker. I think we have um, time for about 10 minutes of questions. And I'll let you okay. manage the question. Hi. <laughs> so um, you started off your talk with the be bold um, advice. And then you talked about how experts tend to underestimate cost reductions. And then the middle section of the talk was about resolving expert predictions. So how did you or could you incorporate the be bold idea into resolving expert testimony? Um. Yeah, so interesting. So, I mean, one, one issue is maybe not the question you quite asked, but is this issue of we're now it's pretty clear that the experts are overly pessimistic. And so we are trying to come up with ways to help them do a better job. So I'm not quite sure if that's what you're asking, but um, and so one way, and it has to do with this cumulative reasoning, actually, one way we're looking at is there something called um, learning curves or experience curves. And so those are where you look at how the um, technology increases in how many people use it. And there's kind of a typical uh, amount that you reduce the cost as you do that. So our idea is to start by kind of showing people these learning curves and then helping them to kind of work around that because they're actually they're so far below where they should be. So that's, that's one idea we have. I'm not sure if it's quite answering your question, but it's getting in that direction. Hello, neighbor. <laughs> um, so this is all really inspiring. And since we're here on a college campus, I'm wondering is what can be done in addition to setting limits and targets that would get um, the kinds of young people who can do all the math and science that we need to do this kind of thing to go into energy work rather than building a new social media app that's going to break the political system, <laughs> or a fabulous new mortgage-backed security. <laughs> yes, I don't know exactly. I would say my impression is there are a lot of students out there who are actually very passionate about working on sustainability and on energy. I think part of it is, is giving them hope. And I also, I mean, my other Thing I, would, I don't know if it's exactly answering your question, but what I'm interested in is that, again, there's this innovation and it's everywhere. It's in all parts of the supply chain. So we need everybody on campus. We need the scientists and engineers for sure, but we need everybody, right? We need the historians, okay? We need people who know how to do storytelling so that everybody can get on board. We definitely need people from the School of Management. We need business plans. We need, you know, people who know psychology that can understand these things. So we really need all the students. Um, and I do think, actually, if we do set these really bold goals and we have, you know, money 
following those goals and people see they're going to make money innovating, then you, know, you will get the people who are kind of purely money driven, I think, will get excited about energy. We're already seeing there's, there's people are pretty excited about energy innovation. So I'm very hopeful that people will, will get involved. But it helps if we can set these really ambitious goals. Hi, Aaron. Hi, Scott. Yeah, so I was curious, the first half of your talk when you were talking about portfolios, mm -hmm. felt a little like a different personality from the second half of your talk, when you're talking about um, the role of equity. And I was wondering if we could somehow combine them. You talked about portfolios in terms of solutions. Can we talk about uh, portfolios in terms of problems? Yeah, yeah. And is that something where the field's going? Yeah, no, that's a great, question, and that is, I mean, I was for years doing the R&D, and I always, I, I mean, my, my focus on that was always actually around social justice, because, you know, the thing is, you do need to have smart solutions to climate change, because climate change affects the most marginalized people, and if you don't put in smart solutions, the most marginalized people tend to pay for that as well. But yeah, so that's the whole, the Energy Transition Institute really is kind of around this idea, is let's go, um, and I, I'm interested in really going as early stage as possible and thinking about the science and starting very early to think about how that science connects with equity. And so I don't know if it's just thinking about problems, but this kind of harm reduction and thinking about where things can go and then solving those problems ahead of time. So for carbon capture and local pollution, we can really think about carbon capture uh, technologies that capture all the local pollution. I mean, there are some potential technologies out there that capture all your local pollution. And so you kind of solve both problems at once. And so that's, that's one example. So I'm very interested in that. Is the field going that way? I, I don't know, but I think it's, uh, it, it's, it's a very promising, yeah, to, to kind of think about that. I mean, I guess I will say one other thing is we did have, I don't know if DV is here, um, but, DV from chemistry and Michael Ash and uh, Mark Schumann and I um, got a proposal from NSF to have a workshop to really think about this idea, right? How do we think about research at the intersection of these energy technologies, these solutions, and social equity? And so we had people come from all across the country and talk about it, and we, we did publish a paper in Nature Energy, which we're hoping to get out to the DOE and to NSF and people who are funding these research portfolios and getting them to think very early about the equity aspects. So, thank you. Thanks so much for a really inspiring, uh, a nice talk, inspiring talk, and a combination of um, hope and technical details. Yeah. Um, I had two short questions. One was, I'm wondering if folks have or your team or others have thought about moving beyond experts to trained expert forecasters, but not necessarily experts in the field. Like mm -hmm. I'm thinking about like the super forecasting movement mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. platforms like Metaculus that are some sort of combination of crowdsourced uh, predictions from people who are trained to reason probabilistically. Mm -hmm. um, and the second question is I'm wondering if in the, um, in that, prototype analysis, if there's a factoring in of risks and costs of technology. So I'm thinking in particular with nuclear, where there's sort of this like catastrophic risk element and whether that the costs there or the probabilistic cost is factored mm -hmm. in. Thanks. Right, right. Yeah, so the first question is interesting. Um, haven't really thought about this. That, so you would, you would have to still involve the actual experts, right? Because that's the thing is we need to understand like what we're even doing, you know, are we looking for a new molecule? What's the chance we find this molecule? How is it gonna affect things? But yeah, I mean, I was talking more about the learning curve. So something like you're saying could be very interesting though is really bringing in other types of forecasting with experts and other, and database models as well and trying to combine those. That is something that's very interesting. I don't know if any of you are really working on it or not. We've We've had some workshops. We've been trying to get the, the DOE in particular interested in funding the science of forecasting energy technologies. We haven't had a lot of luck with that yet, but if we, if we do, that would be great. Um, and so, yeah, when we're looking at, let's see, what do we look at? We're looking at the, right, so we have R&D investment, 
And then we're looking at the cost of, say, nuclear in 2050. So that cost of nuclear, it includes the catastrophic costs mainly in the sense of how much that adds actually to the cost of nuclear. So because we are very careful about nuclear, that's why nuclear can get very, very expensive because we want to be very, very careful. Um, we don't, I don't think we explicitly model like the actual outcomes of these things, but it's more like how do you get nuclear to um, satisfy people's you know, requirements of safety. So we mainly just looked at cost accounting for what, you know, what the economy will look like, so what those costs will be. So that's a good question. Okay. Thank you all for participating today and for your questions. It's a great discussion. Um, unfortunately, Chancellor Subhaswamy could not be here with us mm -hmm. today, so I have the distinct honor of sharing the Chancellor's Medal with Professor Baker. This is the highest honor bestowed on a faculty member on our campus. Congratulations. I want to invite everyone to join us for some refreshments in the back of the room and uh, more conversation with Professor Baker. Congratulations again. Thank you.